Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. Hey, Bruce, how are you doing? I'm all right this morning, David. How about yourself? Good. So I'm here today with Bruce McCurdy of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm David Staples. So, Bruce, last night we had some fun. We went to see the Oilers prospects game, um, Mm -hmm. two periods, mostly five-on-five, some four-on-four, and we got a really good look at uh, a number of players we'd never seen before live, Evan Bouchard, uh, Ryan McLeod at the top of that list, and both uh, really impressed. So what was your... Let's start with Evan Bouchard. What was your take on him? Well, I got the I got the business about him being such a good passer, very natural mover of the puck. And I noticed, like, defensively, like, he was patient. When he was in traffic, he would just find his partner, get the puck to a safe spot. Or if the partner returned the puck to him, if he had any chance at all to get his head up, and pick out a pass, he would make that pass. And it would be whether it was to the far blue line, into the neutral zone, or what have you. Uh, but in, uh, it wasn't like every time the puck was on his stick, he was throwing the long bomb. It's just part of his arsenal. And, and uh, very much gave the, the impression of being the, uh, you know, the, the, the ball control quarterback that knows what all of his options are and checks off and, uh, Gets the uh, gets the puck to a teammate for the most part. I, I, my one th- impression of him was that um, on the cycle when the puck was in his own zone for extended periods, he was maybe a little bit vulnerable when he was standing still. Yeah, his defensive play was a little bit lacking. He seemed a little bit too much gap, um, not right on guys, not aggressive enough, maybe not strong enough yet. But so so that was the downside. I like to compare him to Darnell Nurse, who was the last kind of defenseman taken in that same range by the Oilers. And I would say Bouchard is way, way closer at the same age to being an NHL-ready hockey player just because he's got easily translatable NHL skills in terms of his passing of the puck, which sure can get you out of a lot of trouble fast if you can really do that well in the NHL. Um, And his shot, his hockey IQ with the puck, everything to do with moving the puck offensive. I mean, he'd be close... I mean, uh, he reminded me a lot in some ways of Oscar Kleffbaum in terms of just the ease with which he moved the puck. He's not a particularly dynamic skater or fast player. And he, I don't think they're, they're, bo- they're both good skaters and uh, smart with the puck and maybe needing work on his defensive game. So I see Bouchard, you know, Nurse at the same time was so raw. He just had all kinds of troubles uh, in terms of reading the play, moving the puck. He was much more rugged and much faster player, far more raw than Bouchard is. Um, Bouchard really is going to challenge for a job. I can see the orders being very tempted to keep him on the third pairing mm-hmm. um, as their power play quarterback. And in sheltered minutes, if he played like 16 minutes a game and played the power play, that might not be a terrible move for the orders. And I can see them being very tempted for them to make it. Bruce, there was one play, you know, I, I went into that game, as you know, with a full head of hair last night. And <laughs> there was one play that was so hot, it singed my hair off my head. Oh, I see. That was the, that was the, um, McLeod comes in, puts a pass over to Yamamoto, who um, drops it back to Bouchard, who who one-timed it with a, just an exquisite slap shot into the uh, top corner. It was the kind of play, like, you and I, we go to these games all the time, and for me, uh, with my memory now, it's just it's just certain moments stick. Like uh, in the Jasper game, Le- Leon Dreisaitl firing backhand passes across the mm-hmm. ice, stick t- tape to tape. Mm-hmm. And uh, Nurse running over people like he was the second coming of Eddie Shore. But that was one of those moments that's going to stick with me. Evan Bouchard just firing that puck right into the top corner off that pass from Yamamoto. It was a spectacular play. Huge reaction from the crowd too, right? Uh, of course. Uh, yeah, Bouchard, um, last night he got into he got into good position to shoot three times and he let fly three times. The other two shot, one went ro- rocketing over the crossbar and off the glass, a wrist shot from the top of the left circle. Uh, and the other one also missed the net, which uh, one of the things I noticed in the in the three days of workouts that I, well, the two days that they had pucks, uh, his shot is pretty accurate and usually on the net, and the scouting report said the same. 
last night, uh, you know, he, he missed, fired slightly on two, and then the third one, uh, you know, picked the corner. Well, I'd rather have a defenseman shooting for the, you know, shooting for the corners as opposed to the crest um, of the goalie. I mean, he's going to score some goals. But what my takeaway was his ability to get into shooting position to, you know, to uh, take the pass and let fly right away. And, and uh, he's got some nice offensive instincts and not just on the passing side of things. Yeah, he could walk. He walks the line really well. He he uh, he pinches in well on the attacks and um, – makes the pass across right on the stick. He makes tape to tape passes. And that's something that we didn't always see from Edmonton Oilers defensemen. You know, at the pro level, of course, it's harder than in a dev camp four on four, five on five game. You know, it's kind of a little bit of an all-star atmosphere, right? The players just are flying out there. But nonetheless, Bouchard was just consistently hitting players, um, players moving fast right on the tape. And it was, it was really nice to see. Ryan McLeod was another player, um, the Oilers second uh, round pick 40th overall he was consistently ranked about 19th to 30th in the draft and mm -hmm. wow Bruce he put on a show especially when they went up four on four he was just flying he was the fastest player on the ice flying up and down the ice with the puck he just he really I, I think he's the player who stood out in terms of grabbing everyone's attention and and yeah. it's suddenly people thinking wow the owners really got a prospect here well I watched uh, like say two days of workouts before that and a lot of the three on three drills were just blue line in. And there, so there was no sense of the full ice. So some of the talents, the guys that you're looking for, like stretch passes from Bouchard or rink length dashes from uh, uh, McLeod, they just weren't part of the equation of how they were playing. It was such a contained uh, environment they were in. Well, last night we saw some of both of that. And especially McLeod, man, oh man, he had the, I, I wouldn't be surprised that he had the puck on a stick more than any other player in that game, including Yamamoto. Just uh, go, a lot of it, you know, going wide, but moving the puck north and with speed and, you know, and, and with some shiftiness and, and uh, lots to like in, in what we saw. And I think, uh, did he pot a goal or I'm trying to remember who scored. I think he got uh, one of the goals. He he was in on that absolutely in on passing one. play first, where, first goal, uh, where yeah. Bouchard put it over to Yamamoto, Yamamoto to McLeod at the side of the net, right back to Yamamoto and in the net. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, you just never know what to expect. And of course, most of these players, if, if, if history tells us anything and, and the fact, you know, it's such a steep pyramid, most of these guys are not going to make the NHL. Nope. And when you go to these games, you get a real sense of the separation between players. I, I find at least, and I, because and I remember most distinctly when we went to Jasper to watch the Dev Camp game, and and three players stood out. Of course, Drysaddle and Nurse, but right. then there was also Jujar Kyra, mm -hmm. who just looked bigger, faster, more confident, just uh, just a force on the ice uh, compared to the other players. And and that's exactly how Ryan McLeod looked last night. Yeah. Just yeah, just true. a force out on the ice. And so there's other players. You know, you know there was some made a good impression that what's his name McPhee. Graham mm -hmm. McPhee, George McPhee's son. Yes. I think it's his son. He was 20 year old, uh, scored just two goals in his first year of college, but t I think 12 goals last year, second mm -hmm. year. And he's got a chance. Uh, he's just such a smart, gritty. He's like uh, Johnny. This is, I always make, of course, my references back to the 70s. Johnny, he reminded me of Johnny Pie Face McKenzie, that oh, wow. kind of <laughs> smart, gritty hockey game. So Graham Pie Face McPhee. <laughs> yeah, he strikes me as one of those guys that's probably a pain in the butt to play against. Mm -hmm. And it never hurts to have some of those on your team. I mean, all the other teams seem to have them, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. All the Oilers do too, except yeah. Zach Cassian looked like he took a sleeping pill for all of last season. I hope, hopefully it's worn off by now. But yeah, he's got he's got uh, smarts and he's got uh, – it's a clear um, – built-in work ethic. Uh, McPhee impressed me four out of four days. And it was, you know, attention to detail, focus on the job at hand, and take a beeline to the puck, right? And he was he was doing all that thing. His skating's okay. His skills are okay. You know, he scored a nice goal, top shelf, backhand, and tight. Um, and he had, uh, uh, but he looks, you know, like a definitely a bottom six class player, but you need some of those. You need to grow them from inside your organization, which is where the Oilers have been an epic fail. 
Yeah, I could be wrong, Bruce, because it's hard to get a sense of the talent level. Like you're comparing now to the years in the past, and you're, of course, as an Oiler fan, you're you're always optimistic when you see these players, and then always. retrospectively, you look back. But it just seemed like there was a there was more talent in this game. Damn, that but, Mark Pouliot looked good, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and Jeremy Blaine didn't look bad. You know, like there's all the you know there's all these players because all these guys have a lot of skill didn't look bad you know in, in the moment and Braden Christopher looked okay in the moment right I just got I did get a sense though that there was a higher level of, yeah. of overall talent there was just seemed to be a few more players who had it going on in terms of their passing skill set skating so there's you know Cooper Marodi looks like he he could be a player you know we don't know if he's going to be uh, Ryan Patoni or if he's going to be better than that right mm -hmm. but uh and Ryan Patoni was a really good AHL scorer yeah, uh, and I think almost put up 17, 16, 17 goals in his one year with the Oilers as well, but he yeah, never right. stuck. So, but I still got a really, you know, there was Dmitry Samarukov who looks like, you know, kind of if I was to make a comparable, he's kind of at Brandon Davidson's level, um, that kind of player, um, perhaps, maybe. But there was just, there's and the, and the goalies, you know, Skinner was just so impressive. Uh, he's huge. He's absolutely huge and didn't give up anything. So I'm saying there was, you know, maybe at the other order camps, there was maybe two or three guys. Maybe there was four or five this time yeah. who, who kind of made me take notice and think, yeah, there's something in there that could work in the NHL. Well, the last time the camp was in Edmonton was 2015. Of course, that was McDavid, Dreisaitl, and Nurse. So there was sort of three guys especially the two guys especially the one guy who like super stood out and grabbed everyone's attention and i'm not sure we have uh that level of elite talent on display in fact i'm quite sure we don't but what i liked at this camp was uh the, the quantity of potential depth players and you know what david that 2017 draft looks golden i was impressed to varying degrees by all five of the guys i signed you mentioned skinner uh, you mentioned Sam Rukov, who I really liked last night. I thought he he was excellent. I really like how he closes, and uh, how he how he controls gaps, and uh, he's quite mobile. And and uh, you know I'm not sure he's a big dynamic force in the offensive zone, uh, but he is a sort of an all around looking defenseman. And he was I would say the only guy on the ice last night who was looking to initiate contact. There was very little hitting in that game, but uh, Sam Rukov, he didn't always come out the best, but he, was, uh, he wasn't he was shying off. Uh, and then... Uh, There's Maximoff the and Safin the wingers, from that the same two draft. Two wingers in the, in the fourth and fifth round uh, that you just named. Uh, Ostaf Safin, who didn't really shine last night, but he, he had, his, had some very good moments uh, earlier in the week. He's six foot five, and he can... He can fly like he's got great he's got great speed for such a big man when he puts gets the puck in any room on the outside look out because uh he can uh, take it down the wing fast and he's got the big body to take it in front and a decent shot um the other one uh maximov has got an absolutely wicked shot and he's got a goal scorer shot and i, I have actually coming out of this with pretty high hopes for kirill maximov as a potential goal scorer uh, point score for the Oilers. Tyler Benson uh, also, he he was pretty slow and un, not very noticeable in the first period of the game, but in the second period of the game, he started to wheel and deal with the puck and make some plays. So there's been so many Oilers second round draft picks and third round, who do you, third round draft picks, Travis Awanek, Mitch Mraz, just go on and on, you know, Curtis Hamilton, who have gone to the AHL and in their first couple of years done nothing, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm really hopeful and I, I think it's a reasonable expectation that's not going to be the case with Tyler Benson that he's going to go down there and this is his first first time we've seen him at de development camp because he's always been hurt in every previous year and yeah. we're seeing enough now that I think when he goes to the bake he's going to be a, a top six player this year get some serious ice time and and put up uh, you know I, I don't know how many points but if he if he if he got like 40 points I think that would be uh, not bad first season. I think he's going to take a couple of years in the AHL because I think the injuries really have set him back somewhat. Yeah. But uh, there's a there's a player there could be a player there, Bruce. Well, I was um, I understand that it was the first summer that um, Benson has uh, 
Tasha had been healthy and training throughout the summer since he was 16, which is at least, I'm not sure how the math is, whether it's two, two summers for sure that he, he was out, if not three, that he's been dealing with some issues. And like I say, you don't catch that all up in a year, but you start to catch up when you start getting bloody healthy, which, you know, he did play the full year last year, and now he's had the full summer to train. And the Oilers are, are hopeful that uh, uh, he's going to, uh, you know, step up his game a significant level as he turns pro this year. You know who we're not talking about, Bruce, is Caleb Jones. And uh, we're not talking about him because he didn't stand out in the game at all. Mm -hmm. um, which is a little surprising to me because he played a full year in the AHL. He's older right. than most of these players. He's more experienced. Mm -hmm. Um, he's a great skater, so you'd expect in a game like that he'd be dominant, but he really wasn't. He he just totally blended in with the other players. So, um, you know, it's it, we'll see. I mean, I think Ethan Bear is now taking a step ahead of Jones. I wouldn't. I I would have bet that Jones would have done that ahead of Bear because of his Jones's skating. But um, yeah, so so that's a player who's we'll see we'll see where he goes this year in in the Baker, in Bakersfield. Yeah, he's. He's a player that when he's playing well, he tends to be unnoticeable. He's one of those defensemen that just just uh, is his cog in the wheel and, you know, gets the puck, moves the puck. Uh, but as you say, I didn't see him really standing out last night. I saw him better earlier in the week. And you know what? He was, they only had two guys in that entire camp who played pro last year. And he was one of them. Shane Sterrett, uh, one of the goalies, was the other one. All the other guys were playing at uh, junior college uh you know amateur level of uh, level of of, uh, of hockey so you would expect as you say him to have a have a, an edge and there was nothing really that stood out as you say so so we got another look at yamamoto he he looks that much more confident and solid and um he he was super confident on the ice you could just you could just see he just thought like i'm the best player here and um I, I, you know, when I got the puck, it is mine. I'm going to dominate this game. And he pretty much did that. Um, so, uh, and the same player, the same comparable came to both of our minds with, with Yamamoto. And this is, it was Jordan Eberle. And, um, you know, they're both small, skilled forwards, smart. Um, and uh, there's a really good stick handling the puck. So I can, you know, Eberle um, stepped right into the NHL without AHL time. And, um, Based on the owner's need for a winger, yeah. based on McClellan seems to really like this player. The other players where we were told really like this player, I would not be surprised at all. I know that everyone's saying he's going to be in Bakersfield this year. Man, I'm starting to think, you know, especially when we hear the names that the owners are able to sign this year in terms of talent. They, they're going to need a guy on the wing who can put up 40 points. Yeah. Everly put up, I think, 45 in his 43 rookie. points. 43. And he led the team in scoring. That's how bad it was in 2010-11. And he missed about 15 games, did he yes, not? Yeah, and he still led the team in scoring. <laughs> I can see Yamamoto easily making the team, Bruce, is what I'm mm -hmm. saying. Well, uh, what he showed last last night, uh, I mean, passing. I mean, he, he, he had two goals and an assist, and, and I think anybody would have named him first star of that game. Um but he had the puck on a string and was feeding guys left and right and, and finding the passing lanes and, and showing the ability to to hold the puck the extra fraction of a second or, or release it slightly ahead of when when the defenseman might be expecting and finding that little hole to get it through. And if it wasn't directly on the tape, at least getting it into a region where the other guy could do something with the puck and, and uh and take it take it into the net front and his hands are such that especially in close to the net this is where he reminds me of Everly, is his ability to dangle down low uh below the hash marks and and below the circles and still make something dangerous out of it yeah let's talk now bruce um so there's some names floating around let's just end up with this um kyle so mark specter has brought up the orders uh being in the running to sign Brodziak says that's a real possibility. Um, then there's um, Adrian Dater, a reporter out of Denver, is saying Blake Como might sign with the Oilers. And out of Boston, Joe Haggerty is saying that Slater Kukuk, um, 
might sign the, with the orders. And I was really against the Kukuk signing until I figured out exactly how easy it is to spell that name, Bruce. And I turned same, around completely on it. Twice. Same name twice. Kook on top of Kook. You know, he used to play with a guy named Kachuk. And they sat <laughs> together on the bench. Somebody got a picture of him in the bench in the minor leagues, and it was Kook, Kook, Kachuk. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't get much better than that, Chris. We can, you just dropped the mic on this podcast. We should just end it now. <laughs> anyway, Cook, Cook, yeah, he's still a young guy, eh? Like he was a number ten overall draft pick. He's a Reinhardt he's class. 20, he's a Re class of Reinhardt, yeah. And he's the uh, uh, he's the sort of on the big end of that field where they thought big stay at home guy, and those are the guys that are that are. Uh, uh, seems to be struggling to make the breakthrough when you look at uh go back over the last 10 years Bruce and look at defensemen drafted which I did recently when I was looking mm -hmm. at point totals and right. man there are so many of these great big guys who have been drafted high who just have not panned out at all in the NHL seems mm -hmm. like there was a real appetite for the Darian Hatcher class defenseman mm -hmm. um based on the hockey that was played uh the heavy right. hockey that was being played but hardly any of them have been, like Colton Tubert was taken high the Rangers took a Duncan McElrath. I oh, mean, yeah. it's just, it's, but it's on. And Reinhardt and Kukuk are another couple of guys that have really struggled to make it. So if he, if he does come, I mean, he only played about 11, 12 minutes a game last year in right. Tampa when he did play and he didn't play very much. So um, he's the, he's a Reinhardt class defenseman and I would expect would, would cost the Oilers about the same. What do you think about Blake Como as a possibility? I was going to add Jamie Alexic to your list. But uh, yeah, we'll 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 watch. Hey, the it. Penguins qualified Jamie Alexic. Yeah, yeah, he's no, coming. Right, you know, he's coming on. There is there are some early positive reports about Alexia. I still think he's a player. But one of the problems with those guys is it takes them years. You almost never see those guys making it early. It, you know, when they're 23, 24, 25, you're sort of going, oh yeah, look, that guy is sort of half decent now. And after you've forgotten about him, and he's moved on to two different teams, and then he starts to emerge. Uh, Blake Como, yeah, uh, yeah, not bad. You know, two point four million he made last last three years. Actually, I think he had a three year deal, two point four. Uh, and I'm not sure if that price tag is going to come down because I'm not sure that they uh, can afford that. But he's pretty much established himself as a thirty point forward, and I don't think he's done much of that in the top six without looking real close at his line mates and so on in, in uh, Colorado, which I haven't had a chance to do yet. But my impression of him is he's a bottom six grinder type that can stick the puck in the net once in a while. And uh, I still hate him for that cross check in the ribs that he gave Brandon Davidson that one time. That was just a complete cheap shot that injured him. I don't, I don't like cheap shots that injure people. I don't, you know, I don't mind hockey. Obviously, sometimes it's just hockey. But anyway, he's a, he's a, a, let's call him feisty if he's going to be playing for us. I'll we'll just say he's a feisty little guy that doesn't back down. And <laughs> but we'll we'll see. I mean, his his price is such. I mean, another guy of similar ilk that interests has some interest to me is Matt Calvert of um, Columbus. Uh, same thing, about a little over $2 million a year, and he's sort of 25 point guy. And at a certain point, it's there's you got to get some offense out of these guys. Now, you do want guys that can just hold their own, kill penalties, play the tough minutes, not get crushed. Uh, but you'd rather find those guys for $1 million than two or two and a half million. I think Como will be a little less than you're thinking. I think he might be about half of that because he scored eight goals the year before. Um, you know, I'd rather. I, I'm not. I'm okay with if they bring in one of these kind of veteran players. I, you know, I'm a little gun shy on them. Just the UC Jokinen experiment last year, Camilleri experiment. It seemed to me like those guys actually took away playing time from other players, like Slepyshev and Puliyarvi. And and the coach seems to have a sweet tooth for veterans. So I'm a little worried about them bringing in a couple of veterans, and then we don't, you know, we get more of the same, right? Like, what good? Was the Mike Camilleri and the UC Jokin experiments last year? They did. They did no good except they, they probably set the development of Slepyshev and Pulleyarvi back. So I'm a little concerned about that. At the same time, there's this hankering for the veteran presence. You know, the, the Matt Hendricks presence. So if they bring in a guy who who is that player, and that's why we're hearing names, I think like Chimera and Brodziak, 
one guy like that, but I really would rather them see in terms of bringing in two or three more forwards, guys heading into their prime as opposed to leaving their prime. So more like the Ty Ratty or Nick Shore out of Calgary, that kind of player, as opposed to yeah. an older player like who Brodziak's 34, um, Como's 32. Yeah. You know, just get the get Kyle Brodziak when he was in 2009, look for the the current day version the, of Kyle Brodziak. Kyle Brodziak, Brodziak that the Oilers, that the Oilers traded away for nothing? Yeah, because they because McTavish yeah, said he didn't have enough jam, Jeez. and uh, he I didn't have enough compete. I still hate that trade. Hated it the day it was made. Yeah. It was a very unpopular trade. Brodziak was popular because he was young, cheap. He was showing some ability to win faceoffs. He wasn't really like, tough at the time, but. He had been part of the Krustiniaks, Bruce. You know, that line. With yeah, he was scoring points. He was winning face-offs. He was killing penalties. He was big. He was right-handed stick. He was cheap. I, I mean, what's not to like? But, I mean, now he's uh, at the other end of the career curve. And, I mean, even Blake Como that you mentioned is 32. I mean, that's one of the things that I would, if I had a choice between him and Matt Calvert, who's 28, I would choose the younger man, right? Even though, the, you know, other things are fairly similar. Uh, but then you're, of course, you're always going to have to talk about the ex Oilers, right? We got uh, Jason Chimera, we got um, uh, buddy you just named there, old guy uh, Brodziak. You got, uh, of course, we got the new class of Toby, Tobias Reeder and uh, Riley Nash, two guys that didn't sign with Edmonton in the first place. Uh, but all of a sudden their names are getting linked. And of course, every once in a while, somebody throws out the name of Nail Yakupov back into the equation. And and the king of all old Oilers, Brandon Davidson. Yeah, exactly. We all get excited. Everyone seems to get excited when those names come up. And, and, you, and you know, Reader only had 25 points last year. Mm -hmm. uh, I think something like that. So uh, I, you know, if he's, if he's going to be two or $3 million, forget about it. I, I, I just think so. So again, I, I, I'm okay if they sign one of these guys. Obviously, you know, as the thirteenth forward or the or the twelfth forward on your team. And Brodziak, you know, he he can kill penalties and he can uh, win faceoffs. He finally got above five hundred and fifty percent in the faceoffs last year, Bruce. He's always about forty nine point five uh, in, over the last ten years, but that's partly because he takes so many more PK uh, faceoffs than um, power play faceoffs, and it's and it's quite a bit harder. I don't know exactly what the the league average split is, but I'm guessing it's probably about 46% or 45% for the PK guys yeah, on average. 45 to 55 on the, on the, on the PK versus the PP. So that can, that can actually uh, um, sway a guy's overall percentages. He's a specialist on just one of those units. Well, Brodziak was 52% last year overall, but he was 46.5% on the PK. Mm -hmm. And they were a sizable proportion of his uh, overall face-off total. So I'm, again, like, I, I like, you know, we all have a soft spot for these old Oilers, it, it seems, and I, and uh, it's okay to bring in. But I really would rather them see, like like you say, Calvert or, or Nick Shore or Anthony Duclair, a younger player, would be to me more interesting than uh, an older player. Uh, you know, bring in someone to, like someone like Pontus Aberg, Ty Ratty. If those guys work out, then you have a player for a number of years uh, who's part of the group, who's who fits in on the team. So uh, that's what I would prefer to see. Anthony DeClaire, now that's an interesting case. You know, that guy is still only 22 years old. Turns 23 later this summer, like he was a youngest among the youngest in his draft class. And he made the NHL very early, probably too early in retrospect. They rushed him. And he got traded from uh, Rangers to Arizona. He got traded from Arizona to Chicago. And even at 1.2 million, uh, Chicago never qualified the guy. I don't know if their cap crunch is so severe or if there's some other underlying story that. I mean, I've heard a thing or two about Anthony DeClaire, and I tend not to believe those things, but what, sometimes the actions of the teams tell you something. Such yeah. a cheap player and such a young player, so much potential. You'd think there was a – it doesn't make sense. Like, just looking at the numbers, not having seen the player, the, when you look at the numbers and the salary, it doesn't make sense not to qualify him. You'd think he'd be worth 300000 less than Drake Kajula, now wouldn't you? You would, Bruce, but you don't, you know – 
He's Drake Kajula is on your Brian Ferland list of players that you're know, you know it's, it's you can't not, get through it's, a podcast it's, without it's, attacking Drake Brian Ferland and Drake Kajula. He's not, but uh, he I think he probably uh, he did well on his second contract. I actually have high hopes for that player, but he's got a long way to go. And I, I when you have when the club has a negotiating hammer, they should use it. And I'm not sure that they they really did in that case. Are you going to start ripping on the Eric Griba move again here? Is that... uh, well, that's another case where they just kind of <laughs> pissed away uh, a bunch of cap space for, for no real good reason. But whatever, it's done. We gotta we gotta look at that uh, at that cap hole of uh, him and Pouliot, of course, which is significantly more money. But you know, the one move I would rip on Bruce is the Koskin and the the amount of the Koskin and signing. Like you know, I get. I get the need, like, because when the backup goalie goes in, he's the number one goalie. It's a, it's a different thing than signing a fourth line player or a third line demon. Right. So I, I get the salary on on one level, but he better be good. That's all I'm saying yeah. for that yeah, salary. I gotta get it right. I gotta he better, get it right. yeah, they better have gotten this correct because they paid a lot of money for this player, and that money could have gone to a forward. So mm -hmm. this is really on the their scudding. <laughs> better have gotten this one correct, and. Uh, so the very next day, back. Colorado signed Fran Kuz, a young guy from the um, KHL. Uh, I think he's Swiss. Anyway, um, and he had sort of equivalent stats, and, and they got him for $690,000. And Koskinen went for $2.5 million. Like, there's a, like four times as much. And there's just this huge gulf there that says they obviously think Koskinen is borderline elite, maybe even super elite. And he's going to have to, uh, you know, he, they just have to start getting these things right. And uh, this, well, we guessed on two years for Eric Griba, and we we paid him for two years, and we when we played him twenty games. It's when we sign a guy to a contract, the guy plays through the contract and delivers the goods to the value or more than the value of the of the contract. And there's just not enough of those on the on the team, at least certainly not last year's team. Bruce, let's end off the podcast with a secret good thing about last night's prospect game. What's one thing that you, one player, or one thing? I can start if you want. Go for oh, it. Okay. Uh, all right, I'm going to take the one that you're probably going to take. I, I like the play. Michael Kessel ring mm -hmm. was surprisingly good. Big, uh, tall, yes. fairly aggressive, fairly skilled. So, you know, for a guy taken – eight billionth in the draft he looked like a hockey player and the good thing about him he's got three or four years of uh or is he going to college i i, I heard his co he got a he got a scholarship and then the coach got fired and now he's out of it and he might be going to the us ushl or the major junior leagues anyway uh i think he should go to college <laughs> he, he could use the three or four years to develop but he did look like a player that's a good pick by you. And you think he's an 18 year old kid that's six foot four that went in the sixth round. Like I was expecting to see gangly, uncoordinated, uh, mistake prone, uh, you know, with flashes. And I saw flashes and I hardly saw any of the other stuff. And he is big. I mean, he was, uh, he, he's, uh, he was playing on an all righty defense pair. Uh, where he was a little guy at a mere six foot four, and his partner, who I think might be the guy I'm going to pick here, Vincent DeHarnay, six foot seven, 224 pound monster, and a surprisingly polished player. Now he's quite a bit older. I think he was 20 when they drafted him, so he's been around for a while now in the college ranks. Uh, but uh, uh, he was he, he was a player that grabbed my eye positively on each day of the thing and uh, good at boxing out and sort of using his wingspan. It, it wasn't really a display, a place to, to display physicality, so I can't really say anything about that. But he looked more like a contained kind of big, big defenseman. And with, uh, I won't say offense, but I will say offensive instincts. He wasn't afraid to go in deep in the zone and move the puck and, you know, drive it towards the net and, and uh, uh, longest of shots and probably already too old to really be uh, considered a, a, a full-on prospect. But uh, 
he was the guy who uh, captured my attention. He was the Kyle Bigos. Well, of yeah. the of the DevCap game 2018, or the Ben Betker of the DevCap game 2018, because because those guys always look kind of good in those DevCap games. They might obviously they're really up against it in terms of becoming NHL hockey players. Mm -hmm. uh, but so we've seen that player before. But I agree, like they they do just their size and the fact they can make some plays uh, catches the eye. Well, Bruce, let's leave it there. Thanks okay. for thanks for talking today. All right, thanks for listening, everyone watching and in the meantime and in between times this has been another edition of the cult of hockey podcast yeah we missed that we don't have i don't know how to put music on here yet maybe someone can tell us <laughs>